Hello there, welcome to Vox Oceanus. In this month's episode, we will be talking about the German commerce raider Wolf and her epic voyage during the Great War. At the beginning of World War I, the Germans had used commerce raiders to attack British trade. Now, these early commerce raiders fell into one of either two categories. They were either cruisers that had been on station elsewhere outside of Germany, or they were converted ocean liners. Both of these types of vessels were disadvantaged because they had one crippling requirement for a commerce raider. They had high coal consumption rates, which means they needed to capture lots of coal in order to be able to continue moving and doing their business, destroying British commerce. Partially because of this reason, but also for other reasons, within a few months of the start of the war, all of these commerce raiders had been hunted down and destroyed. Partially because of this, the Germans turned to submarines to continue attacking British trade. However, there was a couple of problems with this particular method of attack. First of all, short range. These ships were only able to attack British trade around the British Isles itself, as well as in the Mediterranean close to bases that they operated from. The other problem with using submarines to attack trade is that they gathered large amounts of outcry from neutral nations, foremost among these being the United States. Now, Germany at that time was not being run by stupid people. They realized that it's a bad idea to prevent to get neutrals against you in public opinion sphere during a war. Because of these two factors, the Germans decided to try sending out commerce raiders again of a different type than the ones that they'd used before. Now, the first of this new breed was a commerce raider by the name of Mo. Now, the Mo was a converted cargo ship, as would be the case for all of the future commerce raiders sent out by Germany. What this meant is that it was easier for the ship to blend in. In addition, the ship tends to have better fuel economy, which means longer range, and these ships were used to attack British trade outside of Europe and the Mediterranean. The Mo, in fact, being the first, was incredibly successful, sinking through capture or through mines that she laid, a grand total of 19 different ships on her first voyage, which began December of 1915 and ended in March of 1916. Based on this, it was decided to outfit additional commerce raiders and to send them out to attack British trade across the world. After her first trip, the Mo was refitted to go out back into the Atlantic and attack trade there again. In addition, at the same time that the Mo was sent out the first time, another commerce trader was sent out, the Grief. Unfortunately for her, British signal intelligence was particularly effective, tracked her down, and sank her in the North Sea. Others were sent out for other purposes. One, the Sea Adler, was to attack shipping in the Southern Atlantic and the Pacific, this one being powered by sails, and th another one was intended to go and attack the Indian Ocean trade and then return to Germany. Now, this ship was so overloaded that as she attempted to leave Kiel, she actually ran aground and broke her back. After that, the Germans decided that they were still going to send the ship out, and so they decided to get a new captain and a new ship and do so. Much of this old crew was still to be sent out on this new ship. Now, the captain that they selected was a man by the name of Karl Nurger. Now, Nurger was different compared to most of the officers in the Imperial Navy in that he did not come from a noble family. He was middle class in origins and this was not at all common in the Imperial German Navy. So he was a bit distant socially from his fellow officers, but he did have one quality in particular that recommended him above other candidates in the German Navy. 
this quality being that he was lucky. In 1900, during the Boxer Rebellion in China, his ship had been brought under fire by Chinese shore batteries and had suffered quite a pounding, several men killed, many more injured, and despite the fact that he did not take cover, he managed to emerge unscathed. In addition, at the beginning of the Great War, at the Battle of Hegel and Bight in August of 1914, the cruiser that he was serving on had come under heavy, heavy fire, so much so that the water around him was so churned up that it was described as if it was boiling. And yet, when the shell fire stopped and everything settled down, it was discovered that only a single shell had actually hit his ship. Because of these qualities, it was decided that Nurgur should take command of this new commerce raider, go to the Indian Ocean, lay mines at several points, and then return to Germany. The Admiralstab, the German Admiralty, had decided that it should be just a quick trip, mainly laying mines, taking a few ships, and then back to Germany. One load of coal, filling the ship, would be sufficient for such a voyage. Nurgur, however, had other ideas. He, when telling the Admiral Stab what his plans were, said that he intended to remain at sea for a full year, at least. Now, that length and duration of voyage was something that would mean that he would have to subsist off of the ships that he captured, both for fuel and for food because there were no friendly ports left in the areas that he was going to go to. And if he's put into neutral ports, which there were a few, especially Dutch ports, that would just serve to alert the Allied forces in the area that there was a commerce raider there. So he would be facing some stiff challenges if he decided to actually do this. Now, Nurgur was told to find a ship and to outfit it for this voyage. Now, one of Nurgur's primary concerns was that he get a good ship. Now, after looking around Kiel, he decided on a cargo ship by the name of Vachtfels. Now, the Vachtfels was a pretty new ship. She had been completed in 1913, and had not seen much use, so she was practically brand new. The ship's captain had kept her in very fine condition, so much so that the brash was still polished. So she was a good ship to choose for this voyage because of the condition that she had been kept in. Once the ship was chosen and he arranged for the Admiralty to buy the ship, the conversion to a commerce raider was undertaken. The first thing that was done was to arm the ship. She was armed with seven 5.9 inch guns, which were hidden behind the bulwarks, which were modified so that they could be dropped down and be capable of engaging a ship. In addition, the ship was also armed with a total of four torpedo tubes, and she was also outfitted with a scout float plane so that she would be able to get information about the local area and not only scout for passing cargo ships, but also possibly be made aware of hunting warships as well. Now, other changes that were installed were the inclusion of significantly increased crew spaces. A hold was also set aside for the eventual prisoners that the ship would almost certainly carry, having captured merchant ships and followed the rules of war. In addition, they also set up a massive paint locker with enough paint to repaint the ship several times over, changing her appearance as necessary. To further this deception, the ship's single funnel was given a sleeve that could be adjusted in size, both width and height, thus changing the appearance of the ship. And something similar was done to the ship's masts, as they were arranged to be made into telescopic masts, so that their height could be changed as well. This would be used to great effect later on in her voyage. After many months of training, 
the ship, which had been working up under the name Jupiter, was sent to sea by Nurger officially on a training run just before heading out to sea. However, based on thoughts that there were conspiracies in the dockyards that were telling the British when ships were sailing, this was actually a result of British signals intelligence with Room 40, but based on these fears, Nurger departed Kiel in the middle of the night on November 30th, 1916. As he did so, the ship's name, Jupiter, was blotted out with paint, and with that, her career as the Commerce Raider Wolf began. After leaving Kiel at the very end of November, Nerger decided to head north up along the Norwegian coast, across through the Strait of Denmark, into the North Atlantic, and then south to the first target that his mission had detailed, which was the mining of Cape Town, South Africa. Now, during this initial part of the voyage in the North Sea, Nurger was blessed with lots of fog and no sightings of the British blockading squadron. And so he was able to slip out unmolested and unnoticed. By December 10th, he had reached the Atlantic Ocean and was free from worry of the British blockading squadrons. For the next month, Nurger's ship sailed through the Atlantic following fairly standard day-to-day -day routine that you would expect for a ship sailing in the middle of the Atlantic. On the 16th of January, they approached Cape Town. As they're approaching Cape Town, though, they spot a convoy of troop transports that had just left Cape Town earlier that day, led by the armored cruiser Cornwall, one of the ships that had hunted down Admiral Spee's squadron at the Battle of the Falklands in December of 1914. This ship, if it decided to attack the Wolf, would undoubtedly have won. It was heavily armed and heavily armored as well. However, after exchanging pleasantries required and sailing under a British flag, the Wolf passed by without any trouble. That night, the Wolf laid 25 mines near Cape Town. Two nights later, on the 18th of January, she laid another 31 mines near Cape Agulas before continuing on her way out to do the same to ports near India. Almost a week later, the mines took their first victim. On the 26th of January, the steamship Mathuran struck mines while approaching Cape Town and sank. Now, because there hadn't been any German ships in this area since 1914, it was initially believed to be an act of sabotage, and as a result, these incidents, as they kept piling up, were attributed to naturalized German citizens, and there were calls for them to be rounded up and deported, or at least imprisoned, until such time as they could be deported. Either way, this is something that will happen everywhere the wolf went for various reasons. Partially, this is because of the censorship that was in there, as well as the blackout on what actually happened after various different inquiries were held. On the 6th of February, a troop ship was struck by one of the mines laid in the Cape Agulas field. While the ship did not sink, it was a very disturbing thing for the locals in Cape Town. On the night of February 15th and 16th, the wolf had made it off of Colombo near the island of Ceylon, modern-day Sri Lanka, where she laid 55 mines across the sea lanes leading to that city. Now, while she was doing so, she picked up several freighters' transmissions, including one from the ship C de Izaguare, and we'll come back to that ship a little bit later, but it is perhaps fateful that she passed so close to the wolf on that night. Now, as the wolf continued along, moving to her next location for mining, more ships struck the mines that she had laid. The very first one off Colombo struck the day after her field was laid there, and several other ships struck both the, the ones in Cape Town and Colombo again after that. 
On the 27th of February, the wolf captured her first ship, an oiler by the name of Turritella. However, on approaching the ship, they found that she looked a little odd, a little familiar. As it turned out, the Turritella was originally the trader Gutfels, a ship made by the same company from the same construction lot as the wolf had been. Because she was a German-built ship, Nurger started to have doubts about trying to sink her because she was a fine German-built ship. To get around this, the wolf's first officer decided that he should be able to take her out and use her to mine the Gulf of Aden, which is where the ship operated quite heavily. As a result of this, the first officer, a man by the name of Iwan Brands, was ordered to take the Turritella, along with 25 mines, to lay those mines in the Gulf of Aden, and to facilitate this, he was to take some of the crew from the Wolf, but the Turritella's crew, being mostly neutral Chinese, were simply hired on to continue working the ship. The Turritella was renamed the Sign Majesty's ship, Iltis, and sent on her mission. On the 1st of March, the Wolf then captured another cargo ship by the name of Jumna, and with her, captured a good amount of food and supplies. The 4th, the Iltis, dropped off her mines in Aden. However, the next day, she was intercepted by British forces, and though the British ship that intercepted her was very, very weak, the Iltis only had a single 2-inch gun and was much slower than the approaching British ship. As a result, as per his orders, the German's commander decided to scuttle the ship to prevent capture, and when news of this is sent out by Ryerless to the British Admiralty that they had captured a German raider in the Gulf of Aden, that message was received by the Wolf, who decided to get away a few days later, on the 11th of March, the wolf captured another ship, the Wadsworth. This one contained large amounts of food supplies, which were definitely useful to the wolf, especially given that her new course was taking her south below Australia before coming back up to the trade route. Along the way, on that voyage, she also captured and sank an empty three-masted bark by the name of the D. Needless to say, that did not provide a lot in the way of resources for the wolf to be able to use. Having traveled so far south, they started running into bad weather, there wasn't a lot to do, and the general mood on the ship started to deteriorate. Now, by the 24th of May, having sailed south of not only Australia but also New Zealand, Nurger decided to head north. And based on the needs of his ship, which had been going non-stop for six, seven months at this point, they needed to do some refitting. So they needed a secure, unobserved bay to do their refits at. And Nurga decided that the best spot for that would be a spot called Sunday Island, today known as Raoul Island, in order to do this refit. They turned back up and they go for their refit. Now the next day, the Sea de Izigoara, the ship that I mentioned that passed by the wolf while on its way out by Colombo, was arriving close to Cape Town. She runs into one of the wolf's mine and causes the first large casualties suffered by ships sunk by the wolf. Almost 140 people died as a result of that mining. On June the 2nd, after about a week on Sunday Island, which was quite picturesque, the previous inhabitants of the island having been evacuated in 1914 at the start of the war for fear of German commerce raiders, a lot of their stuff was still there, including a small little calendar that was still set to 1914. While they're on this island, getting fresh food, uh, refitting the ship, repairing. While they're doing this, on the 2nd of June, 1917, they've been there for about a week, a steamship by the name of Warunia was coming up from New Zealand and spotted the wolf. Now, the wolf also spotted them, 
Unfortunately for the wolf, two out of her three boilers were at that point out of commission and being serviced. However, Nurgur still had the services of his airplane, the wolf chin or wolf cub, and he used it to great effect. Used it to convince the Warina and her captain that the wolf was fully operational and was going to run them down if they did not surrender. As a result, the Warina surrenders and the wolf gains over a thousand tons of coal, which they were running low on, as well as food and other supplies, but most importantly, the coal. After that, the wolf put the sea to skull her, but this course of action was delayed by the capture of another ship, a sailing ship by the name of Winslow. They're going to return back to Sunday Island on the 16th of June. On the 18th, they will finally sink the Warina, and on the 22nd, they will do the same to the Winslow, but only somewhat successfully. They burn her to the waterline, but her wreckage will be found later. After sinking these two ships, the wolf will then depart Sunday Island to mine Australia and New Zealand waters. Now, when they do this, a few days later, they're going to discover that two of the prisoners that had been captured from the ships that they had been taking were missing. Odds are, they escaped to Sunday Island, and this idea was further reinforced by the fact that some of the crew that had gone back to Sunday Island after capturing the Winslow had reported that the calendar had been turned to the day that it actually was then, rather than the date when the family would have been evacuated, which would have been in August of 1914. So there's some speculation that these two men made it to the island. However, they were never seen from or heard of again. During its mining off of India, the wolf had dropped off mines not only in Colombo, but also off Bombay. And during this time, the latter half of June, several ships were mined off Bombay as well, sparking even more panic. By the 27th of June, the wolf had reached New Zealand, and they laid mines off of Wellington. In addition, they laid an additional 25 mines off of North Cape, New Zealand as well. After having laid those two minefields off of New Zealand, the Captain Nurger took his ship down to southern Australia and laid an additional 30 mines off of Gabo Island. He then continued up north, doing his best to avoid the large numbers of British and Japanese ships that he had been told were in that area by the prisoners. This was, in fact, whether on purpose or not, a lie. There were very, very few Allied naval assets, most of them having been withdrawn to the Mediterranean and the North Sea, leaving Australia, New Zealand, and the Pacific Ocean area very undefended. As a result, the Wolf had very few enemies to actually worry about in that area, but those that were around were definitely something that he did not want to run into just because it would let people know that he was there. Now, just a few days after he laid the minefields off of Australia, the first ship ran into them. On July the 9th, having sailed across to the islands in the Solomons area, he captured a sailing ship by the name of Beluga. This is going to mark the first time that Captain Nurger captured a ship with women and children on board because the captain had brought his wife and his six-year-old daughter with him. So they were accommodated in officers' quarters to give them a better place. A few days later, on the 15th of July, another ship is captured, the Encore, and the wolf is going to continue along, gaining information through wireless receivers, including some information about a ship that left Australia bound for Rubal, where the Australians had a garrison. Due to the information that they were able to pick up, they were able to intercept the ship, and when they came aboard, they were even able to greet the captain by name, tell him that he was late, having expected him to arrive a few days before, and asking them to show him 
where his fine Westport coal was. I'm sure that that was quite the shock for the captain of that ship, the Matunga. In addition, the ship was carrying several Australian military personnel bound for Rubal, including the doctor and his wife. And these people would end up having similar accommodations provided as had been provided for the captain of the Beluga, a man by the name of Stan Cameron. And so the wife of the doctor would end up proving to be a fairly large distraction, a woman by the name of Rose Flood. Now, after they deal with that ship, the Matunga, they're going to continue along because Nurga realizes after looking at the ship that with the amount of stuff that's on board that he needs, he's going to need to find another safe harbor to offload everything that he needs. So what he's going to do is he's going to sail north of Rubal and then turn west. And he eventually arrives at Ofak Bay on the island of Waigo off the western end of New Guinea. Now, while they are shifting the cargo from the Matuga onto the wolf, and because of the oppressive heat and humidity, Initially, they're going to allow a lot of the prisoners up on the quarterdeck, under guard, of course. Now, because of what had happened on Sunday Island, the Germans are particularly afraid of the prisoners trying to escape. The prisoners had already figured out that, what with the sharks in the bay, the inhospitable terrain, the Germans on watch, the machine guns, and all that stuff, escape was not going to happen. However, a lot of the newly arrived Australians were still being Australians at this point, and they decided to try and kind of tweak the noses of the Germans a little bit and kind of sit around and look and whisper conspiratorially to themselves and raise the Germans' paranoia in general. However, this ends up not being a good thing because the Germans had just also captured the entire alcohol assignment for the garrison of Rubal on the Matunga, and some of them started to imbibe these newfound refreshments. After doing this, one of the guards got startled by one of the prisoners getting out of his hammock after they'd been brought back down to the prison holds to go to sleep for the night. Got startled by one of the guys getting out of his hammock to go to the head, which was basically a bucket on one of the ends of the hold that they were in. Because of this, he panics, starts firing, calls for more guards, Prisoners start fighting each other because they don't know what the heck's going on. And at the end of all the commotion, when everything is sorted out, and some of the guards, having been certain that some of the prisoners had escaped and were trying to swim to shore, which turned out to be alligators, it was found out that not a single prisoner had escaped. Some of the German officers found it quite amusing. Most did not. And things got a little more strained between the prisoners and their captors. After finishing the unloading of the Matunga, on the 26th of August, the wolf departs that bay and heads in the direction of Singapore. Now, initially, this move looks to be insane. Singapore is the center of the British naval power in the region. There's basically one way in and one way out, so far as the wolf is concerned, the one way in is the direction that they're coming from. The other entrance that they could theoretically use is the Strait of Malacca. The Strait of Malacca is very, very narrow, and so the chances that they will be found and stomped if they try to go through there are exceptionally high, and so attempting to go this direction seems like a death wish. And in fact, on the 2nd of September, it almost seems like it is, because as the wolf is going up, in the direction of Singapore, she runs into an Australian warship, the Sai. Now, the Sai is an old ship. If she actually ends up engaging the wolf, she might do some damage, but she's going to be sunk, beyond a doubt. And she closes very, very close to the point where Nurger was very, very tempted to launch torpedoes at her and just sink her right out. But based on his need for secrecy, he does not fire. And somehow, Sai, either because the captain's not paying attention, or for some other reason, doesn't challenge the wolf and continues on her way. Now, the Sai apparently did not mention anything of this in its logbook. Nurger and his gunnery officer were certain 
that they must have been seen, but nothing came of it. So they continue on their way. The wolf, on the 4th of September, uses the last 110 of her mines that she started out with and lays a field north of Singapore near the Anamabas Islands and a crescent going from west to east, taking her back out on her escape path. Now, the next day, a man by the name of Tom Meadows, one of the prisoners, the captain of the Turritella, in fact, he did not like the Germans. He deeply dislikes the Germans. And so he was doing his best to let the British know what was going on. He had written up a description of the wolf, what the plans were, because just about everybody on board had figured out that they were going to be mining off of Singapore. This is not the first time that he had done, he had done this. He also had a sketch of the ship, put these into a bottle, and he tossed it overboard. He did this right as the prisoners were being sent back below at the end of the day. And as he was doing so, he spotted by one of the German guards. Needless to say, doing something like this, if he's caught, could very well get him killed. But he's doing it anyways, so he's got some courage. However, in order to prevent this, as the guard is coming over, he kind of rushes into him, knocks him over, tosses the bottle overboard, and then claims that knocking the guard over was completely an accident. The ship's officers, both the prison officer and Captain Nurger, were convinced that a bottle went overboard. Unfortunately, there was not enough evidence because the German guard hadn't seen for sure that he tossed a bottle overboard. As a result, and the fact that killing this man would probably insult a riot among the prisoners, Captain Nurger decides to instead only confine Meadows to solitary confinement for five days instead of killing him. Now, a few months later, the bottle will be found, and the information is going to be eventually brought to the notice of British authorities, but not until far too late. However, the information about the Singapore minefield was definitely useful because apparently the wolf's crew were off on their soundings and not a single ship ran into any of the mines that were laid off Singapore. By the 10th of September 1917, the wolf had passed through the Alas Strait and back into the Indian Ocean, making good her escape from Singapore. All the while, while this was happening, ships had been running into mines. On the 26th of September, the wolf ran into a Japanese cargo ship, the Hitachi Maru. Now, the Hitachi Maru was a bit different. She carried a large numbers of passengers and a very, very rich cargo. However, when the wolf came up, closed with the Hitachi Maru, raised the German flag, fired warning shots, ordering them not to send out any transmissions and to slow down and prepare to be boarded, the Hitachi Maru decided to try and run away and resist. They had a gun on the quarter deck as the ship tried to speed away, her crew attempting to get to the gun. The wolf fired on the Hitachi Maru, taking out her gun, and after several shots, all directly hitting the gun, taking out the crew several times. They also sent one salvo into the ship's wireless shack to disable that. After that, the Hitachi Maru finally surrendered. Now, all of this was highly irregular. This was the first time that the wolf had actually needed to fire its guns, other than for signaling warning shots. Hitachi Maru's captain, Captain Tominaga, claimed that what he was doing was following the instructions provided by the company for what to do if he ran into a U-boat. And the documents on the ship from the company proved that that was the case if he ran into a U-boat. However, as a result of getting his crew members and his passengers killed and placed in danger, with one passenger being killed in the exchange of fire as well as 11 crew members, he decided that he was not going to leave the bridge of his ship if they were to sink it. Nurger forced him to be removed, brought aboard the wolf, because the Hitachi Maru was a very, very rich prize, and Nurger wanted to take the ship back to Germany. Because if he was able to do that, that would have been an amazing propaganda coup. Now, after arriving the next day in the Maldives to get everything set in order, transferring of supplies, as well as being able to transfer prisoners, including 
the lady prisoners from the ship to the Hitachi Maru, the wolf, because she was going to need more coal, decided to continue raiding, looking for that extra coal that was needed. She departs on the 3rd of October to do so. On the 6th of October, though, so just a few days later, the wolf chin flies over the Hitachi Maru, drops off a message telling them to go out and to meet the wolf at a pre-assigned location. Now, on the way back, there's going to be various changes happening for the passengers. A lot of them are going to end up disliking the German officer placed in charge of the ship, a man by the name of Carl Rose. Rose was not particularly a pleasant person for the male passengers to get along with. However, when it came to the female passengers, he was quite charming, would be the word I would use. Very, very smooth, very much a gentleman, or at least that's how he wished to purport himself. Either way, by the time the wolf and the Hitachi Maru got back together, there were talks of effectively scandal going back and forth. So things were interesting for the passengers, to say the least. In addition, during this time period, you have the wolf out there hunting for ships. This hunt proves to be fruitless. After having been at sea for such a long period of time, the wolf is starting to have some engine problems, which is going to slow her down a little bit. They're just not as effective as they used to be. In addition, there's undergrowth, which is going to decrease the speed of the ship as well. While the wolf is out hunting, news is going to come back of mutinies that were taking place in Germany. Now, a lot of these mutinies were actually less mutinies and more strikes, but they were dealt with quite harshly, and this is something that will become a problem of sorts for the German crew of the Wolf as well, something that will eventually become a problem for the entire German Navy. Around the 20th of October, the Wolf and Hitachi Maru rendezvous off Coco Island, the Wolf, as I mentioned, being unsuccessful in locating a source of more coal. By November 7th, after removing as much as possible from the Hitachi Maru, she is scuttled. Most everybody is up on deck to watch the ship being scuttled, except for the captain of the Hitachi Maru, who is physically ill from the shame of what happened. Then, three days later, the wolf captures a Spanish cargo ship, the Igotsimendi. The Spanish are a neutral country, so normally, Nurga would have to let him go. However, she carries 5,000 tons of British coal bound for Bombay. Because of this, the Igotsmendi is up for capture by the rules of commerce warfare. As a result, Wolf is going to return to Coco Island and sort out what to do with the cargo and the ship. Now, as a result of this, a lot of the passengers that had been on the Hitachi Maru while the Wolf was hunting are transferred back over along with the German prize crew and the Spanish crew stays aboard their ship as well. So a ship that had originally had a crew of about 30 people now has 60 people on board as well as several thousand tons worth of coal. The large amounts of that are transferred over to the Wolf. In addition, by this point, the Wolf Chin the, the airplane, has been permanently disabled, her canvas covering, ripping, and being unrepairable by this point. Since she is disabled, she is disassembled and stored below for the rest of the voyage. After doing this, on the 17th of November, the Wolf and the Igots Mendi depart Coco Island and begin their voyage back to Germany. However, the next day, there is a rebellion by some of the German crew on the Wolf. They refuse to do work, and the two ringleaders are imprisoned pending trial back in Germany. Nurger maintains command. This is the closest that the ship ever actually comes to an actual mutiny. On the 30th of November, the wolf captures another ship. This is the last ship that the wolf captures in the Indian Ocean. And if it had not been for the fact that she was a sailing ship, the wolf would not have been able to catch her. By this point, the stress on her engines and the fouling on her bottom had become so much that she is no longer capable of making more than 10 knots. So she's making single digits for her speed now, which means that she can't capture all that much in the way of ships. 
After rounding the Cape of Good Hope, she continues up into the Atlantic, running into a French bark called the Marchal d'Avolt, which she captures, brings food aboard. Now, after that, Nurgur is going to continue on, attempts to call from the Egots Mendy in the middle of the Atlantic on the 23rd of December. Now, unfortunately, apparently the Egots Mendy had this weird little quirk where she actually rolls heavier in a light swell than she does in a heavy swell. This slows down the coaling process significantly and results in the two ships battering each other remorselessly. On the 25th of December, Nurgur decides to spend coaling temporarily to celebrate Christmas. The next day, he attempts to resume the coaling, but the swell causes the ships to continue to bash into each other, resulting in significant damage. The Egots Mendes superstructure is bashed down, and the wolf even has some of her plating on the waterline buckled in, letting in water to the ship. As a result of this, Nurgur is forced to stop the coaling the next day, not having taken enough coal aboards to get her back to Germany, meaning that she'll have to try again later. By the 1st of January, the ship, which had been at sea for over a year at this point, begins to see the first signs of scurvy setting in amongst the prisoners. A few of the crew will end up getting scurvy as well, and a disease called beriberi, which had begun to affect some of the crew before they turned up north from south of uh, New Zealand back in May, starts to affect the crew as well. Now, beriberi is a vicious disease where if you don't get enough of the proper nutrients, you actually start to lose the ability to control your muscles. And while that might be very simplistic and possibly incorrect, that is the effect that it has. So these are not good diseases. On the 4th of January, Captain Nurger captures and sinks a Norwegian bark, which he does mainly to prevent the ship from telling anybody where he is. But he manages to find some somewhat flimsy reasons why the ship needs to be stopped and sunk. On the 10th of January, despite the swells, Nurger decides to try and get the last bits of coal that he needs from the Egots Mendy in order to get back to Germany. By this point, they had reached about the equator. Now, Nurger is able to get the last 500 tons worth of coal that he does, but again, the ships were scraping and grinding against each other with the swells causing massive damage. When they finally split up from each other from the coaling, the Egots Mendy had had all of her paint practically scraped away. So, again, this was not an easy thing. On the 24th of January, the Wolf and the Egots Mendy finally sp split up before returning to Germany. During this time period, Commander Rose had been telling the prisoners and the Spanish that they were intending to release the ship to go back to Spain prior to returning to Germany. There is no evidence that that was actually anything planned by Karl Nurger before he got back to Germany. As far as we can tell, these were probably lies to keep the crew and the passengers contented and not going against the German crew on board. Now, just a few hours after the Wolf and the Egots Mendy split up, the Egots Mendy runs into a convoy of troop ships bound for Europe. Unfortunately, it is effectively a repeat of the incident with the Australian ship Psyche. Now, during the confusion though, the Spanish first officer throws the scuttling charges overboard. For this, he is rightly regarded as a hero by the prisoners because, so it is claimed, he tells, told Captain Rose that he did not do it for himself, he did it for the women and the children on board. Either way, brave thing to do. Shortly after this, the two ships are hammered by winter storms in the Atlantic. These storms were some of the fiercest ones that any of these sailors had ever seen. And there was a very real possibility of the ships not making it, and certainly that things would not turn out well, even if the ship didn't sink. For a lot of the passengers on the Egots Mendy especially. On the 8th of February, Captain Tominaga, who had been 
the captain of Hitachi Maru, was found to have disappeared. At first, he was thought to have just simply disappeared and attempted to do some sabotage to the ship, but they couldn't find him. Eventually, his cabin mate, a Japanese officer that had been captured aboard the Hitachi Maru, he found a note from Captain Tominaga explaining that basically he could not continue on, that he had resolved quite a while ago to take his life because of the shame of what he had done and what his actions had caused, and that he would wait until now when he was certain that the passengers would be safe. And he threw himself overboard, based on what we can tell. The same day, the wolf, which had been attempting to return to Germany the same way that it had left through the Denmark Strait, is forced to turn back. And instead of sailing north of Iceland, sails south of it because of the ice. Now, on the 13th of February, the wolf reached the rendezvous point that had been prearranged with the Eagle Tsumendi, waits several hours for her, but does not see her. And so she continues on her way. Two days later, having sailed through the North Sea, the wolf reached the Skagerrak. Now, the Skagerrak is the strait that goes from the North Sea into the Baltic. Two days later, she arrived in Germany. Now, the Eagle had attempted, after the storms, to try and follow the same route that the wolf was going to follow up through the Denmark Strait. Again, because of the ice, she fails to make that route, goes back, follows much the same route, and on the 19th of February, receives word from Germany that the wolf had made it back. However, she runs into a storm that same day, delays her a few days. On the 24th of February, after all the passengers having gotten to the point that they were certain that they were going to be captured by the Germans for the rest of the war in Germany in prison camps, stroke of luck, the Igotsmendi ran aground in fog just a few hundred yards off of the coast of Denmark. Rose attempted to hire a salvage tug to pull him off of the sandbar, but because of what happened and Danish authorities being able to divine what the ship actually was, they decided to declare that the ship was not a neutral vessel, not just a cargo ship, but an auxiliary German warship, and as such, they would not provide help, but at the same time, they would not allow the British to take the ship either. Now, she was a neutral vessel, and one of the things that the Danes objected to were the fact that there were female prisoners, and just prisoners in general, on board the ship. So, hoping that by releasing the prisoners, it would convince the Danish authorities to help him get off the shore, at least let him to hire the tug, he released the prisoners into Danish control. This did not work, and by the end of the day, on the 25th, being the day that he released the prisoners, the weather turning for the worse, and the Danish authorities, while not having had time to act on it yet, having decided to turn the ship back over to its Spanish crew, Rose calls for rescue as the ship starts to break apart. Rose abandons ship, and he and his German crew are interred in, in Danish territory for the rest of the war. Now, on this epic voyage, which had lasted for 15 months, the wolf traveled some 64,000 miles, it had captured or sunk by its mines a total of 25 different ships, totaling about 110,000 tons. So, she was very successful kept the British guessing where she was, and at one point had pretty much the entire naval forces of the Pacific and Indian Oceans looking for her, and still managed to make it back to Germany in one piece. Such a feat of seamanship is very impressive, and very likely won't be seen again except in similar extraordinary circumstances. Either way, it is definitely a story for the ages. Thank you for listening to Vox Oceanus. That concludes this month's tale. If you enjoyed this and would be interested in listening to additional stories in the future, please subscribe. If you have any constructive criticisms, you are more than welcome to leave those in the comment section. And if you would like, you are more than welcome to become a patron and support us on Patreon. Thank you for listening.